Okay, great. Thank you so much. I am Michelle Bailden. I'm the collection strategist for Arts and Humanities and a member of the Scholarly Communication and Collection Strategy Department. And I am Rhonda Kaufman. I'm the Bibliographic Metadata Associate, also known as a cataloger. And I'm in the uh, Acquisitions and Discovery Enhancement Department. And uh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, the work of the Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice Task Force of the um, MIT Libraries Collections Directorate. We were both members of the task force. Um, it's kind of a long name, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. So here at MIT, we tend to use the shorter acronym DISJ. So if we fall into using that, that's what we're talking about, uh, the whole thing, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. Um, so Rhonda and I are here and speaking from our individual perspectives as, you know, former members of this task force, not as official representatives of the MIT libraries and not even as official representatives of the task force. And actually we noticed that a couple of the other members of the task force are tuning in right now. So if you guys have a different point of view or we left something out or, you know, we forgot something, we just want to invite the other task force members to also chime in on chat and like add your perspective as well. Okay. So. so the topics um, that we will cover today include uh, the background, context, and definition, and thought leadership and implementation. And, you know, one thing that we want to point out is that the scope of what we're going to talk about today is actually a little bit broader, a little bit different than what was in the description and in what Marilee just shared. Um, so the first, like what we emphasized in the description was the implementation of the recommendations in my department, which is called communication and collection strategy. And for that, that's also a really long name. So um, if I <laughs> lapse into calling it SCCS, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so the description focused on implementation of recommendations in SCCS. But when Rhonda kindly agreed to join the webinar, the scope of the of our presentation expanded to also include acquisitions and and discovery enhancement, <laughs> acquisitions and discovery enhancement or the technical services, um, ADE. Um, but the other thing was that when Rhonda and I were you know, discussing um, preparing for this webinar, we realized that the real impact of the report of our task force was not limited to the implementation of recommendations. Or in fact, we would say that the, the larger impact thus far has not been on the implementation of recommendations. The larger impact has been in the realm of what we are calling thought leadership, which is the, you know, the second topic we're going to talk, we're going to discuss today. And um, anyone actually who was at the Alex exchange back in May, um, we, my colleague Julia Lanigan and I did focus on this aspect. So some of this material, you might have heard it before, but there'll be a lot of new stuff too. Um, so the title of our task force report was creating a social justice mindset. And mindset is a really important word that we included intentionally in the title of the report. And I think um, when we have conversations in libraries, a lot of times we focus on process and productivity, which obviously we have to. But um, one of our contentions is that ideas, emotions, and human interactions are also a fundamental part of the infra infrastructure of libraries. And so bringing people along in terms of you know, big ideas is also um, pretty essential. So turn it over to Rhonda. So in the Collections Directorate, um, and this is just part of the MIT library, um, we really wanted to answer the central question, and um, that is how do we operationalize the values of diversity, inclusion, and social justice in our daily work? That is, how do we go beyond hiring and programming, um, it, but which is the common way to address issues of diversity? And how do we weave these values into the fabric of our work without it feeling like a burden or obligation to staff? Um, so before we get into it even further, I just wanted to look at the definitions that we came up with, with the t um, in the task force. And we'll go into this a little bit later in the presentation, but I'll just take a minute to read the definitions so that um, everybody's on the same page. And um, one thing we should note about the definitions, if you look at the cool pyramid, um, <laughs> uh, each of the definitions should be considered collectively. That is, each one builds upon and sharpens the previous one. That is, diversity is the broadest, 
um, concept, um, followed by inclusion, and then social justice is, is the, the, the sharpest of, of, of the definitions. So diversity means difference. It is the heterogeneity found in the composition of the workforce, our collections, and community. Inclusion means creating and actively sustaining an organization and community in which all can participate fully, be respected, and be treated as an, in an equitable manner. And social justice is a commitment to recognizing, addressing, and correcting the systemic power imbalances that privilege one group at the expense of another. So with that in mind, um, in, um, let's see, March of 2016, our uh, Associate Director for the Collections Directorate, Greg Yao, um, convened a task force for diversity, inclusion, and social justice in order to answer that central question of how do we operationalize the DISJ, there's the acronym again, <laughs> uh, values in, into the Collections Directorate. So uh, there was a group of eight members from the three departments that um, that are in the collections director at the time. At the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> there have been some changes since then. Um, those uh, the departments were the SCCS that Michelle is a part of, the Scholarly Communications and Collection Strategy, and my department, which is Acquisitions and Discovery Enhancement. So that includes cataloging, acquisitions, e-resources, and at the time, preservation services and um, the Institute Archives and Special Collections. And those eight members um, were from all levels of the, um, of, of like job positions from support staff to professional librarians. Um, and we released the, the document, the report in November 2016 internally and that had some recommendations um, and context for that, for, um, realizing the values of DISJ, and then in February it was released to the public. And I think um, that that was something intentional um, in create, on Greg's uh, part in creating the composition of the task force, I think, which was to make sure that there was uh, equal representation of support staff and professional staff um, mm -hmm. on the task force. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Here's the conceptual framework. Okay. Um, so. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes on something a little bit more abstract, which is the report's conceptual framework. Um, and this uh, framework, which is you know, basically underlying the entire report, um, it might seem kind of abstract, kind of remote, but actually um, what the task force uh, believes is that these are actual realities that shape what we do every day. So the conceptual framework, like in addition to the specific, you know, 40 plus recommendations, the conceptual framework is essential um, to our report. And you know, what was behind this, um, our thinking was that if you're going to run like a program, a department, a directorate, or an entire library system with diversity, inclusion, and social justice as a primary basis, you're going to need a philosophical grounding uh, so that um, everyone, you know, understands what this is about, uh, is on the same page, can get into alignment. Um, about this whole project, um, because there are so many ways to understand what we mean when we say the word diversity. So in that sense, in coming up with the, concept, the conceptual framework, we sort of went past our group's initial charge, which was um, which called for specific projects, programs, and initiatives to promote our diversity, inclusion, and social justice values. So this framework, which uh, is represented visually on this slide, um, it was very much guided and um, inspired by ideas of our director, Chris Berg, who is really well known as you know, a rock star of diversity, <laughs> inclusion, and social justice in academic libraries. Um, and what you see with the two arrows is like on the, the text on the right side are um, structural inequities, you know, economic injustice, social injustice, that's kind of like weighing down on us that are um, systems of oppression. And on the left side, the text are the values of archives and libraries, which are kind of lifting us up and um, offer uh, resistance, a framework of resistance against these frameworks of oppression. And so we, in the report, we focus on two uh, large-scale structures of power, um, and the economic system, and then also systems of social and political privilege and oppression. And one thing that I that I just want to acknowledge straight up is that these two are are totally interrelated, like the the economic and the and the social and the political. Which I, I wish that maybe we'd gone into that more in our report. Um, you can only do so much. You know, I'm for real, for real, man. <laughs> You guys saw how long this report is. It's, it was a lot of work. Um, so 
uh, to start on the right side on the bottom, the systems of social um, oppression and privilege. So this is really about acknowledging that our society and culture are structured around hierarchies and their you know, social and political hierarchies with long historical legacies and oftentimes have a legal basis. Um, the economic system, um, uh, the system of economic injustice that we talk about, we address three different components. Um, we talk about neoliberalism, the commercialization of scholarly publishing, and the corporatization of libraries. And neoliberalism is, I think, maybe the most slippery uh, concepts in um, our entire report. And in fact, it's a concept that was actually fairly new to me like just a few years ago. It was something that I became aware of. And I'll just share, I'll just quote the, the definition of neoliberalism that we used um, in the report. And neoliberalism is an economic and political ideology that frames all aspects of our society in terms of market exchange, foregrounding the role of the individual as a market actor. So one really important element of, of the domination of a neo, neoliberal ideology in our society is the extension of the logic or the rhetoric or the understanding um, of every realm of our society um, in terms of the market, like even realms of our, our society that are not economic, you know, necessarily by, you know, by nature. And so a really good example of this is in higher education. Um, one, uh, you know, legitimate purpose of, of higher ed is to um, you know, train students to be productive workers, to give them the skills they need to succeed in, in the workplace. And that's um, a legitimate and real purpose of higher education, but oftentimes it's focused on as the only uh, reason for higher education. And we start to neglect the other purposes, which include you know, preparing students to be responsible, ethical um, you know, citizens of the world. So that's neoliberalism. Um, the commercialization of scholarly publishing, I think any academic librarian is very well aware of the, you know, the scholarly communication crisis um, that's been going on for, for some decades now. And then the corporatization of, of libraries, it, that part of a report really has to do with the ways in which, you know, in the digital age, um, libraries now need to rely on external corporate entities to provide even the most basic, you know, services and resources, like, for example, the OPAC or, you know, relying on publishers' uh, access to electronic journals and other electronic resources. So, so that's the right side, um, the structural and economic systems. On the left side, we have the values that are stated by ALA and SAA, diversity, democracy, social responsibility, access, and the public good. And these values uh, provide clear implications for how we as librarians and archivists uh, react to these, um, these systems, these uh, political and economic systems that we're embedded in. And acting on behalf of our professional values, it suggests the kinds of responses that we should have. And to us, that response is working together for wider change. And you can see on the next slide, just the, the values, core values of librarianship from ALA and the core value statement from the Society of American Archivists. So um, Rhonda went over the definitions at the uh, beginning of the webinar. Um, so we're just going to pause on them again because we think they're so essential. Um, and just to reiterate that uh, the, these three, diversity, inclusion, and social justice, they're kind of a package deal. You have to take them all together to understand what we're talking about. When we talk about diversity, we also mean social justice. Alrighty, so now we are going to move on to the second part of our presentation, which is about thought leadership. And so um, I'm just going to, uh, I guess, tee this up a little bit by discussing why our task force um, cares about thought leadership. Like, why is this important? And I think, you know, uh, I suggested this at the very beginning of the webinar, which is that in order for us to operationalize the DISJ values, that we would need to create a new mindset across the organization. And um, there's a gap between the broad statements of values, like such as the ones that you see on the SAA and the ALA websites, and the actual granular daily decisions that we make. And um, I guess we would say that the next level down below the value statement, um, what we, we could call it describing a worldview. And that's kind of what we tried to do um, with the, the task force report, is to describe a worldview. 
And, you know, our feeling was that we needed to clearly and comprehensively articulate what it is we see happening, you know, in terms of you know, systems of oppression. How do we interpret these values, like, at a pretty high level and at a large scale in the real world? Now, now, being pragmatic, like practically speaking, um, if you assume a worldview, the, a worldview has implications and does actually yield actions. And we think that articulating this worldview clearly, it, it can help us reveal or uncover the assumptions that each one of us have about what we're doing in our work and why. And if you aren't like very, very clear about the purpose um, or about the philosophy that motivates um, you know, large scale changes in the kind of work we're doing every day, you end up people um, just not understanding like what's going on and in fact sometimes working at cross purposes. Um, so without thought leadership, you actually have a more ineffective or inefficient workforce um, or workforce culture. And actually just the other thing to add is it's really hard. It's like <laughs> <Yeah>. really <laughs> difficult to provide thought leadership and um, it's sort of like a daily uh, sort of enterprise, I guess. To, to talk about these concepts and to try to reinforce them and try to tie them into like what we're doing every day. And it's like the, it helps staff be engaged. If yeah. they don't understand the underlying philosophy behind mm -hmm. it, they're, they're not engaged right. and, and nobody wants that. Right. So then thinking about um, kind of illustrating the thought leadership and then um, how it, it goes from the thought to actual action, we thought of um, three kind of phases of this um, framework. So first you have the thought leadership, um, and the thought leadership provides um, it, uh, an environment with the right thought leadership provides the nourishment and foundation for growth, and it's, a, it's usually a supportive and open environment um, that provides a place for empowerment. So staff can feel empowered to then um, blossom slowly. So within the thought leadership, um, it permeates a cultural change throughout the entire organization um, where small actions start to take place as staff are, be are becoming empowered as they discuss and how they think about these new changes in thought and ideals. And then you have spontaneous grassroots actions taking place. And then those actions get noticed and the values become ingrained into the workplace mindset and then you have more ideas blossoming as everyone starts to understand and align themselves with the values. Um, the small actions um, allow people to lead from where they are and to be their own agents of change and to um, enact these, um, these thoughts and ideals into their own space, into their own sphere and then that kind of, it's like a domino effect and people really start to really um, understand this new change in ideas and then eventually it just becomes what it is. Everybody understands these core values and aligns themselves with them. Um, this also helps to alleviate, now Michelle and I were talking about this earlier, it helps to alleviate the burden of usually, there, like there's usually just like a few people who really believe in some values and um, as this, the cultural, cultural change happens throughout the entire organization, it really alleviates the burden on that, on that select few who uh, really believe in this message and it disperses um, the work across the entire organization because it can be a lot, a lot of mm -hmm. <laughs> emotional work for these yeah. people yeah. Um, to always being the ones to kind of really um, support these ideas. So that's an important thing to think about too. Um, next. next page. Slide's not advancing. No. You need no. to, um, you, you, there you go. Ah. Got okay, it. Sorry. <laughs> I guess the space bar works now. Okay. Um, so some of the small, um, like the grassroots activities, just kind of like these rogue staff members <laughs> decided to take it upon themselves and start doing this work of diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Um, and the thing is, like, we have the environment where that is okay. It's encouraged. Like, go out and do the things. Um, the music library um, started to, uh, their own. Oh my God. 
and then they're part of the Archives and, um, and Special Collections Department. Um, they started um, a social justice um, and music uh, and protest music libguide, and so it kind of collects everything um, around that around that topic. And then the Archives and Special Collections uh, also collected posters, um, if you look on the left side, of from the um, after the 2016 presidential election. There were a bunch of posters. Um, that students hung out, hung up in our main corridor, and it collected people's reactions to the um, election. So we have a whole site on that, and um, the archives decided to really capture that social movement. And actually, one thing to to mention about these two these graduate activities is that. Um, and this is one reason why we felt that we wanted to talk about thought leadership and not just the implementation of our recommendations, is that both of these activities happened um, either before we completed our report or just right after. So it wasn't necessarily that this task force existed, we wrote a report, and everyone like jumped up and wanted to follow the recommendations. It was that you know, our colleagues knew that um, because of this task force, that diversity, inclusion, and social justice were important values and important priorities. And so they began to you know, find ways to they themselves um, uh, impl uh, implement or enact these values in their own daily work. Mm -hmm. So um, the Scholar Communication and Collection Strategy Department, SDCS, um, we were founded in January of 2016. So our department um, is the merger of uh, the Collection Strategy Department and the Scholarly Communication and Scholarly Publishing Program. And so the creation of our new department um, actually preceded um, even the establishment of our task force. So um, the department at CCS was founded in January, and the DISJ task force started in March, and the report came out in November. Um, and so we were uh, charged with um, uh, basically taking diversity, inclusion, and social justice as foundational aspects of our department. And the quote on the slide right now is taken from the about statement um, from our, that you can find on the SCCS department webpage. Um, this was uh, collaboratively written by all of the members of our department. Actually, uh, Julia Lanigan and um, Lori McAllister, who's now at Arizona State University, uh, took the first stab and created this draft, and then um, the, the department reacted and edited and created the overall about statement. So this is one part of the department statement. We take the values of open access, diversity, and social justice as a lens for framing collections, decisions, you know, et cetera. Um, and so one of the really great um, results of the DISJ task force report is it has uh, provided a sort of infrastructure to help the SCCS department understand um, the like, sort of basic uh, charge that was presented to our department. Um, so, whoops. Right, so um, when, when the department was founded, I think it was pretty clear that a lot of people have very different understandings of, of what diversity means. And now that we have this report um, that uh, has been taken up by the entire collections directorate, it gives us a document that the SCCS department can refer to to help us just think clearly about this aspect of our work. Um, so one specific use of the DISJ task force report uh, was a retreat um, of the collection strategy group in March. And what we worked on um, at that retreat was developing subscription cancellation criteria based on the DISJ task force report. And one specific project that emerged from that is a, a publisher scorecard project, um, and I will be discussing that a little bit later on um, when we talk about recommendations. Um, and one other effect that the DISJ task force report has had in other parts of our organization um, is that we're seeing it have an impact even in other directorates. So Rhonda and I are part of the collections directorate. Um, there's also uh, basically the public services directorate is where the liaison instruction and reference department sits. Um, there are three communities of practice in that department, including the arts and humanities community of practice and the social science and management community of practice. And both of those um, COPs um, have a, as a fiscal year 18 goal to basically read the the DIH State Task Force report and discuss how they, as communities of practice, can begin to implement the recommendations and you know, realize the the basic framework that the report offers. All right. 
And then also um, our task force report um, was used heavily for another group. Um, the slide here shows um, part of a report that a, another task force <laughs> uh, or working group um, put together. Um, so shortly after the task force for report was released in November, um, volunteers from across the, all of the libraries um, convened for a group called the Diversity and Inclusion Resource Development Group. And our job, was, I was also on that group, um, and our charge was to provide resources to staff um, to use to fill in um, a new requirement um, that uh, is on their performance reviews, um, and that um, asks them to um, ask staff to reflect on ways that they can realize the values of DISJ in the workplace. And um, it'll be a requirement for all members of the libraries in the next review cycle. So what the group did was we came up with a six-page manual, with and the definitions that we used in that manual were the ones directly from the um, CISJ um, Collections Director at Task Force report, the, the definitions that we look at in this presentation. And we also, um, the manual from the working group provides um, context as well as concrete examples um, for staff and managers to use in navigating um, answering this part of their review, um, their uh, performance review. And it should, be, it should be noted that in this manual, we're talking about DISJ um, being a focus throughout the entire library in every department and at every level, um, and that it's an important part of every job for every staff member. It's a core value um, and core part of the library's mission, and not an add-on to what we already do, but an essential part of our job. So whatever we do, we should really be looking at um, how we work um, through the lens of DISJ. Um, so, next section is on implementation. I, I think actually before I go on to implementation, I just want to uh, reinforce one of the points that we were trying to make in the previous section about thought leadership, which is that um, by writing this report, we provided thought leadership within our directorate um, by giving a, a, a specific document for people to refer to. Um, we help to promote an overall environment that supports uh, DISJ, which enables people to come up with their own initiatives, not necessarily just implementing the recommendations that we created. But the other thing that's really essential is that from one part of the organization, the Collections Directorate, we're able to provide thought leadership across the entire organization. So Entire organization. <laughs> Right? Exactly. I mean, I think that was one of, one of the most exciting developments um, from the report, um, is seeing how the report's being adopted by the public services, by members or by units of the public services directorate, a totally different directorate. But I just really want to like emphasize this, that the definitions of diversity, inclusion, and social justice that our collections directorate task force adopted are now the official definitions of social of diversity, inclusion, and social justice that the entire that every employee of the organization is going to be using for this new performance review requirement. So it's like the 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 work that we did in our task force. It really is like part of the fabric of every employee's work, like every day here at the MIT libraries, and we think that's a really big deal. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. My goodness, amazing. <laughs> so we're super excited about that. So all right, now we are going to move on to implementation, which was what we had promised you in the description uh, we were going to talk about. So um, these, we are Lon and I are going to talk about how our respective departments um, are trying to implement um, a few of the recommendations from the report. Um, and these are um, uh, actions that have been initiated locally uh, by our departments. And I will start out um, talking about SCCS. So there are, are two uh, main areas that um, SCCS is working on right now. The first is uh, we're asking how can we work with GOBI. I, I'm assuming most of you guys know uh, about GOBI. GOBI used to be Yankee Book Peddler, and then it was called YVP, and then it was acquired by EBSCO, and now it's just called GOBI. And um, yeah, I, I, I think you guys you guys know uh, the function of GOBI. Um, so we are uh, uh, SDCS is trying to work with GOBI to. Um, uh, review our approval plan. 
uh, to maximize inclusivity and representation. So we want to work with them to um, uh, figure out how we can do that for ourselves here at MIT to improve our collection around DIHD values. But we're also, what we're also trying to do um, is to uh, see if we can work with GOBI to make um, more systematic changes. So in other words, to, help, to see if we can influence GOBI to change their infrastructure so that all of the libraries who are customers of GOBI uh, can take advantage of that infrastructure to also make more inclusive and uh, representative uh, collections. So back in August, um, the collection strategy and an analysis team, which is part of SCCS, it's a, a sub-team of SCCS, uh, we met with representatives of GOBI along with Rhonda, who uh, came to um, represent the metadata and cataloging point of view, and with Greg Yao, who is our associate director for collections. And from that meeting, um, we've come up with a few actions that we're pursuing right now. And so we're glad that this is a work in progress webinar, because these are things that we are just undertaking and like very much would love to hear your feedback and reactions to like what we're trying. Um, we'd love to hear your suggestions for how we can take this forward. So um, what we would like to do here at MIT is to uh, look for publishers that um, might be missing from the publisher list that Gobi provides. Um, we want to look for uh, book awards, like other book awards um, uh, for uh, diverse books, for diverse perspectives that they might not know about at Gobi. And so one thing to understand about how the um, approval profiles work at Gobi is that um, they profile each book, and if it has won an award, like you know, the National Book Award or the Pulitzer, they enter that into the record like of the book. And you can set up, like every library can set up your approval plan so that you automatically get like the winners of different awards or that you can at least get slips sent to you of um, the winners of different awards. So are there awards out there that Gobi doesn't know about yet that they should add that will help, um, uh, uh, help libraries make more diverse or inclusive collections? I mean, one other idea actually is could they start to profile awards not just for the winners but also the finalists? Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, not just um, the winner of the Lambda Literary Award, not just the winner of the of the Black Caucus Literature Award, but um, every um, a finalist, which would uh, greatly expand the pool. And many of the finalists for these awards are from independent publishers that might not readily find themselves in the regular um, stream um, of the Gobi title uploads. Um, another thing we're looking at are review sources. So Gobi also profiles each book um, to indicate whether or not it has been reviewed in certain key review sources. So you can look at the title. It'll tell you it was reviewed by NPR, it was reviewed by the San Francisco Chronicle, by Nature, by the New York Times Book Review, et cetera. So what we're asking is, are there other review sources that Gobi could treat the same way that would provide um, a way to indicate that the book is from a, a marginalized perspective? So just to provide a few examples, um, could they add uh, QBR, the Black Book Review, um, or World Literature Today, or Bitch Media, which is a, a feminist, you know, had its origins as a feminist zine and then a feminist magazine. Could they add those as some of the key book review sources? And we could then profile, um, we could uh, profile, our, our, you know, change our profiles um, so that we could automatically get slips or automatically get books of every book that was um, reviewed in, for example, QBR, the Black Book Review. Um, and I, I, we're not sure, but we wonder if um, uh, offering them additional review sources to consider, would that also help them identify additional publishers? Because our question is, there is a category of publishers that Gobi offers called AP+, which are outside their normal pool. They're independent publishers, but they've somehow identified a book um, outside their normal pool that they think is worth profiling. By offering them these alternative review sources, we wonder if that will help them uncover additional uh, publishers. Um, and we have a few other ideas that came out of our meeting. Um, could we suggest alternative subject uh, the SORI or, or classification schemes in addition to LC that we could use to search uh, within the Gobi system? Uh, they are open to hearing uh, suggestions for new interdisciplinary topics. So, for example, in recent years, they've added um, indigenous studies as a new interdisciplinary topic that you can um, uh, organize your profile around. And so uh, just in the past couple of weeks, um, SCCS has hired 
a, a student from the Simmons School of Library and Information Sciences to work on this specifically as a diversity collections assistant. She's going to be starting next week. We're very excited to have her working on these projects, looking for awards, review sources, and publishers, et cetera. So if you guys have any ideas about how we should go about identifying uh, the review sources or the publishers, please do share them. Um, and the second uh, idea that SCCS is working on is the publisher scorecard that I mentioned earlier. And the, the basic uh, concept is, um, can SCCS evaluate the publishers we work with according to scholarly communication and DISJ criteria? And again, this came out of a collection strategy and analysis retreat that we held back in March. Um, and you know, by uh, evaluating them according to criteria such as um, is it a profit or not for, not for profit? Is the company owned by a hedge fund or investment house? Um, are, are there gender and geographic bounds in the editorial boards? What are their uh, policies for authors retaining you know, copyright, reuse rights? How do they support open access? Um, that we would have a, a, a template um, of these criteria that we would use to evaluate uh, publishers, and that would help us think about how we do business with them. Um, so the idea uh, was echoed um, you know, separately in a, an issue brief that came out of Ithaca SR in August by Roger Schoenfeld called Red Light, Green Light, aligning the library to support licensing. So he has come up with a really similar scheme to like what we had come up with back in March and, and that we're working on right now. And so this scorecard, again, we would love to hear any suggestions you have uh, for carrying out this work. What we have right now is a draft scorecard, a subset of SCCS um, met yesterday to uh, give it a test run. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. So we're just in our very early days of developing um, this particular initiative. Um, and for um, ADE, the Acquisitions and Discovery Enhancement, which is um, commonly um, would be like the technical services department, it's, uh, it's a work in progress, I mean, right? That's why we're doing this webinar. Um, some things that we have enacted um, would be like in acquisitions, like we love Amazon, but we're trying to re-examine and expand um, uh, uh, acquisitions vendors um, to include like non big boxy things um, publishers I mean um, vendors um, and really trying to do more um, business with companies that might demonstrate the ISJ values like for example we started um, ordering a lot from Powell's and it's a family orient um, family business um, and the US based in cataloging, we're um, encouraging using a, a alternative to SORI um, and say um, enhancing table of content notes um, to use language that the uh, might be provided um, by the author or like using within group vocabularies versus ones assigned by um, Library of Congress because there might be um, different terms and some biases there. Um, and we. Um, there has been, there was like a historical workflow in progress where we kind of didn't pay much attention or um, didn't have the uh, resources to uh, concentrate on foreign language materials. But um, since this, we've re since the report came out, we're really trying to prioritize um, non-English language materials, um, have, give them equal priority to English language materials. And that means for cataloging, um, we are, um, we have a really small technical services staff um, for the amount of work that we do. Um, and so we don't have a lot of foreign language and um, expertise in-house, so we do outsource that. But we're, um, we're, we're sending that out um, more frequently and working with um, some other staff, using um, staff and working together to get um, work um, to catalog non-English language materials. And that also goes for um, preservation. There had been um, a workflow that um, didn't put uh, non-English language materials at the, um, in, in the high priority uh, queue um, for preservation. And now it, that's gone out the window. And if something's not in English, oh well, if it needs mending, we'll do that. So those are some concrete things that we're doing. Um, the thing that, I mean, it's not all rainbows and unicorns, <laughs> and we're not, and not, it's taken a while for people to jump on board, <laughs> um, but because 
ADE, it's, it's kind of hard, and we're, everybody's being really realistic, but everybody's being very encouraging and trying to think of this in our department. Um, in a production-oriented environment, it is really hard to, for some to see how they can be effective in making the change in diversity, inclusion, and social justice when you're just supposed to, you know, like, Somebody once said, like, oh, I just open boxes and I like I work. With, I don't do anything. But we're trying to come up with different ways to um, and brainstorm different ways that staff from all over the department can really think about what they're doing and they might already be doing and 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 really um, like looking at their work through the GISJ lens, but maybe not realizing it. Um, one thing that we're planning on doing or we're starting to do is um, write case studies for um, job positions in ADE. So like if you're an acquisitions assistant or an acquisitions librarian or a cataloger um, or an e-resources person, like describing your daily function and then providing concrete examples of how you can demonstrate the values of DISJ in your daily work. So that is a work in progress right now. Um, we have to really kind of think about it and examine our, daily, our work that way. And also, and this is something that we really do um, try to um, try to trans, try to um, tell folks is that if we're going to, we need to make room and time and space for us um, to do this DISJ work. It's going to take time for us to add extra information in the catalog record and go to another source to purchase materials and think and really evaluate our things. So everybody needs to adjust their expectations if we're going to be um, doing this work. Some other developments um, include diversity funds and extra things like that. Um, but I think the biggest thing is conversation. Um, we are really talking a lot about diversity, inclusion, and social justice all the time. Like, it'll just pop up. Mm -hmm. And then everybody allows that time for people to just talk about it and talk it through. Um, and it's really important that we all have a supportive and open environment for that um, where people can come and share their ideas. I think two years ago, it would be, nobody would really feel comfortable bringing this up. Mm -hmm. And well, that's the thing though, when you're talking about diversity, inclusion, and social justice, it's going to get uncomfortable, and it should be. But the way it's changed is that it's uncomfortable, and we acknowledge it, and we work through that. Um, feeling and talk about it, and people are open to that. Mm -hmm. and so up next, what are we doing? Uh, up next, uh, our whole task force is going to be meeting with the Collections Directorate Leadership Team in just a couple weeks. Um, so Collections Directorate Leadership Team, CDL, it's um, uh, Greg Yao, who's our Associate Director, plus the Department Heads uh, from the Directorate. And uh, we understand that our agenda for the day is going to be talking about systematic implementation of our report, which we are very excited to you know, carry out over the next year. Okay. And that's it. All right. Time for questions. That's it. Questions. That's a lot. <laughs> Great. <laughs> right. You were in for half um, an hour. <laughs> yeah. No, that was, this, this was uh, really just so terrific. And as you can imagine, we've had um, a lot of questions in chat. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Stephen Hearn from University of Minnesota, always a great um, attendee and very engaged. Stephen, you asked a lot of questions. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to all of them, but uh, I'll try to prioritize um, questions that I think are of uh, uh, broader interest. Um, but we did get a lot of questions. Um, just well, and, on, and on feel, a... Just to say, feel free to email us as well. We're easy to find online. If we don't get to your question, feel free to email us. Absolutely, and I will be sharing your email addresses with people so that they can get in touch for uh, for, for more particular details. Um, so on a very concrete note, uh, when you were talking about the um, performance evaluations and or, or performance goals, I should say, and trying to uh, incorporate uh, your values into the uh, performance process, uh, you mentioned that there's a six-page document that you have um, that kind of details. Is that something that is available to people um, or something that you're willing to share? 
I know it's on our internal website. Um, I'll check with our um, with our folks and see if we can share that externally. I don't see why not yeah. personally, but I'll have to double check on that definitely. Yeah, I think people are really interested in in models and ways that um, that you can share uh, uh, more more all of this stuff more broadly. That's clearly quite a bit of interest. Um, one of the one of the questions that Stephen asked was. Is this um, is the DISJ initiative in coordination with a larger institutional effort at MIT? Uh, so, for example, are the library collecting shifts intersecting with curricular changes at MIT, or is the library really exerting uh, kind of institutional thought leadership here um, and uh, making the changes at the library uh, um, not necessarily in concert with? Uh, kind of it, broader institutional changes at MIT? Um, I would say it's a little bit of both. Um, so our president, Raphael Reif, I can't remember when he started. It's been a few years. But um, since uh, President Reif you know, uh, you know, started his tenure as the MIT president, uh, we've seen a, a pretty clear uh, message uh, that diversity and inclusion are you know, core values. Um, so like, for example, um, every year the MIT Excellence Awards are given out to staff across the institute. They're very prestigious awards um, here for MIT staff. And it's been at least three or four years that uh, global initiatives and inclusion is, you know, is one of the awards, one of the new award categories. Um, we have a, a new director for, what is it? It's Institute Community and Equity Officer. Um, and that, the, the person filling that position is the former head of the Department of Physics, um, which is an indication at MIT that they're taking it very, very seriously. Um, so the ICEO office has been around maybe three or four years. So uh, yeah, the overall message here at MIT has been a much stronger one about diversity and inclusion. But I would say that at the same time, like what we hear is that, that libraries are being recognized as thought leaders um, or as pioneers. Um, in particular, what we've heard is that the rest of the institute is paying attention to our new uh, DISJ performance goals and performance review process. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, sifting through questions here. Um, uh, so one question was, uh, how does your collection development policy address self-published materials, and is this a factor in diversifying your acquisitions? Yeah, absolutely. So we have not, we have yet to update our policies. Um, and again, thankful that this is a work, work in progress uh, webinar. Um, it's something that is uh, at the front of, of our minds, at least some of our, some of us, um, that self-published material is something that we need to pay more attention to. And I think it's going to be part of the work of, um, of the student worker who's going to be joining us from Simmons is to, think about uh, how can we think about that in a more systematic way, like how can we include self-published material, um, make that part of our regular uh, our regular workflows. Okay, so something great. we will be addressing, yeah. Yep, yep, and, and again, recognizing that this is a work in progress and that you guys are being extremely um, brave and also very, uh, <laughs> very open in sharing something that very much is in process. Um, can you see any uh, early indicators that this is uh, influencing decisions around archival processing and digitization? Again, recognizing that these are things with sort of long um, arcs, uh, how, how is this um, influencing uh, the archive side of things? Um, so we probably are not the best equipped to, to represent everything that's going on on the archive side, but we will say um, a, a recent a position that was recently developed is a project archivist focusing on the history of women in science at MIT. And I really should have looked at the details <laughs> about that before we came in. I can't remember how long the term is and the specifics about you know the focus, but that would be one concrete example um, of what's going on over on the archive side. Um, and they did just have a retreat well, just a couple weeks ago, I think, where um, what, what we understand is that they did try to talk pretty systematically about how do these values link up to your daily work. And so I think, again, something that's in, in process, like on the archive side, but very much on, on their minds. And forming department right. goals. Yes. DISJ. Yeah, exactly. This is another thing that we're going to be talking about when we go to the Coastal Directorate Leadership Team is that every department in our directorate is going to be uh, forming department-wide DISJ goals for this fiscal year, which, I mean, actually we're already underway and will end at the end of June of 2018. 
so archives like all the rest of us are going to be having um, these goals. Great, great. And uh, just a acknowledging um, Stephen is at University of Minnesota and they have the um, fantastic Umbra project which has been ta undertaken um, uh, within special collections and archives and uh, we have a webinar on that as well. Um, so uh, just a, a reminder to, to you can dig back into the works in progress archive as it were and uh, check out the Umbra uh, webinar. Um, so uh, more questions. Um, what kind of conflicts or tensions do the um, uh, DISJ uh, work bring up um, or does it bring up any, any uh, conflicts and tensions? So, for example, between privacy and sharing or between standards and individuation? Hmm. Uh, privacy and sharing, I feel like that might be most relevant on the archive side. Uh, do you think that makes sense? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like thinking about uh, the, the student posters, like for example, although, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think people were generally contributed to those posters anonymously. Um, and the other was, uh, it was standards and individuation. Standards and individuation, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we work in a um, profession that is very, you know, standards bound. We're quite, we're quite, proud of our, our standards, but, but how do those standards, um, you know, help, help or hinder us in this, in this type of work? Hmm. Um, in terms of, like, cataloging um, and things like that, I mean, I'm, um, so I'm a cataloger, so we have standards within our own um, sort of field there, and um, we kind of look to certain groups and institutions for guidance on things, but um, it kind of empowers us to um, to um, kind of what am I looking? What's the word I'm looking for? To empower, empower us to petition for more diverse, like subject headings or classification schemes, and to change um, kind of historical practices. Um, I think that just by talking about it, um, from my own experience, it kind of opening up people's eyes to what we can do and that we can be um, active participants in um, enacting change in these standards and in these sort of historic um, institutions. Yeah, I think you know, one of the basic premises of our report is that um, you know, every enterprise is situated within you know, these hierarchies, you know, historical hierarchies and systems and that inevitably bias is part of like the work that we do. And I, and I include myself, right, in that uh, this is across the board that people have unconscious bias uh, that's influenced uh, you know, by, by our society, like by our politics. Um, and so I think, yeah, one of the basic premises of our report is that um, we need to question the standards yes. and come up with new ways and different ways. I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Right. I think it's a it's a it's a moving topic here. So yeah, um, what one of the questions is about um, uh, preservation, and it says that, um, and I think I heard this a little bit different way. The, the question is phrased as you mentioned that preservation was giving priority to materials written in other languages, and I mm -hmm. heard you to say that previously uh, priority was given to things that were written in English, and that that has gone out the window. Um, yeah. So I think the, the question is, how does the preservation department now make decisions about um, kind of the order of uh, how, what are the criteria then for um, how preservation um, uh, priorities are, are handled? I mean, I'm not part of so I mean, they I'm make that decision? Do they make that decision on their own or in, consult in consultation with librarians in different areas? Yes, I think everything that they do, yeah, it would be with within consultation, but also within their own um, workflows too. So they just take down, they've taken down that barrier of um, language and that kind of flow from being in English works and non-English works. So they kind of everything's grouped together, and you kind of really look at the object and what works needs to be done, and then yeah, looking at the priority. Um, and if that's, we also have a very small preservation. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they have to really prioritize things, too. Um, I think people might be surprised at how kind of, um, how small staffed we are. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to other ARL. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, and just to be clear, it's not that we're prioritizing non-English over English. We're just no longer deprioritizing right. non-English. So we're giving all items equal treatment regardless of the language. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I, my assumption was is that that was that particular prioritization was removed from kind of the decision tree, um, and right. that everything else would probably be as as it was before. Exactly. Right. Um, and that same that goes also for moving things um, off site to like our storage facilities or um, like. Bef I feel like before, mm -hmm. if it was Eng if it was not in English, it would go. It would be more uh -huh. likely to be stored. And we're going to be doing a storage project in the Architecture and Urban Planning Library in in the upcoming months. And uh, it, that this is definitely going to be influencing like how we think about going about that storage. That um, that it's questionable for us to assume that non English language material should be the first thing to go off campus. Right. Right. So revisiting existing policies with this as a backdrop and a framework for, you know, how have your existing policies been written from a particular perspective and how can they be rewritten? Exactly. So, yeah. Very good. Um, Brian Skid uh, wants to know, uh, can you say anything more about publicity and feedback uh, from the campus, from donors, from the broader community? Um, how How is this being received at or uh, uh, away from MIT. Um, so it's not something that we've like put front and center, you know, externally, like outside of the libraries. Um, it, it really has been something that we've been discussing, you know, within um, the libraries community. So I mean, I wouldn't say that there has been much reaction or much feedback yeah. to it. I mean, I get, I've given like little things here and there, and but whenever I do talk about it, or, like I, I get at least somebody being like, oh, wow, like, yeah, how yeah, do yeah. you even? Yeah, 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 <laughs> right. like, that's a big thing, but it's important work. That's true. Also, I would say, like, I've I've given a couple, like, orientations, like, this year. I'm also a liaison librarian and have you know, told the incoming students, so, you know, graduate students, that this is a part of our mission, and they're very enthusiastic um, and very interested in it. And, of course, these are students, though, who are on the uh, social science humanities, like, side of things. Um, so oftentimes are very prone to be interested in, in these topics anyway. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to thank you guys so much for uh, for sharing what is clearly very much a work in progress. Um, uh, this was really clearly food, food for thought for many of our organizations. I was also so gratified to see so many institutions, uh, including MIT, uh, show up with groups uh, to watch, um, learn, and support this work. Uh, just a, um, a special thanks to, uh, to our um, wonderful MIT presenters today. A reminder about our upcoming uh, webinars, and also just a final note that this recording, this uh, webinar was recorded today, and we will be uh, sharing that out with you guys later on this week uh, when we have it up online. So I just want to thank uh, you, Michelle and Rhonda, for uh, for and uh, also you, indeed all of your folks at at MIT uh, for your thought leadership and for your uh, for sharing everything with us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been great. Thank you.